Hey, how's it going everybody? Remy Sovereign here from RemySovereign.com. Today I have a special presentation that I want to share with you guys. And what we're going to be talking about today is metabolism, specifically exercise physiology and sports nutrition. And so we're going to be talking about anaerobic glycolysis and the anaerobic athlete. So we're going to talk about some nutritional needs for the anaerobic athlete. We're going to talk about the anaerobic glycolysis, specifically the metabolic pathway and a lot of factors that could influence anaerobic glycolysis and how you can optimize an athlete's performance uh, specifically for uh, the anaerobic based athlete. So what we'll be covering today is anaerobic glycolysis. We'll, we'll be going over the specific metabolic pathway. We'll be talking about various cofactors and coenzymes, so magnesium, vitamin B3, B6, all which are very important to anaerobic glycolysis itself in terms of uh, various metabolic reactions occurring. Talk about what an athlete needs to support anaerobic glycolysis and improve performance. Talk about some ways fatigue potentially occurs and how we can potentially delay the onset of fatigue, as well as some nutritional needs for the anaerobic athlete. And then we'll talk about the importance of diet, training, and recovery uh, for the anaerobic-based athlete. So we'll tie those three kind of important uh, concepts together. So firstly, before we begin to get into anaerobic glycolysis, we're going to do a little bit of a review. So firstly, where do we get energy from? So we get energy from food, which is simple. But food itself, energy is stored in food's molecular bonds. And what ends up happening is when they're stored in their molecular bonds, when we consume that food, it gets into our body. The, these molecular bonds, the energy in these molecular bonds is chemically released, and it's stored in these cells, our body cells, as adenosine triphosphate. So you're probably wondering, what is adenosine triphosphate or ATP? So let's talk about that. What is ATP? So adenosine triphosphate is the universal source of biological energy currency. So without ATP, we would not be able to survive or live. So ATP basically is energy released for cellular work, and we need it for various metabolic reactions, pumps, transportation of molecules. So looking at specific pumps like sodium potassium ATPase pump, magnesium ATP proton pump, or the hexokinase enzyme, which we'll be talking about within glycolysis. So those are just a couple specific examples. So we need ATP because without it, we would not be able to function or live. So now what fuels do we ultimately use to generate ATP? So we like carbohydrates in the form of glucose, fats in terms of fatty acid and glycerol, proteins in the form of amino acids. Mm -hmm. So fats typically elect the most amount of energy and carbohydrates and protein will elect less energy, but carbohydrates are typically the most efficient fuel source that we have, our body has and uses. The reason being now is that when we consider them, all three groups, they contain a carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecules. However, with regards to protein, it contains a nitrogen group, and so in order to break protein down, we need to remove that nitrogen group, which is kind of an additional step, and it takes longer to break that down, which makes it not an efficient fuel source, and we only see protein being used in terms of prolonged exercise or periods of starvation. When we consider fats, they... Although they lick more energy than carbohydrates, they take longer to break down just because they contain a much uh, larger group, a uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen group uh, compared to carbohydrates. So that's kind of the big difference between the three. So when we're looking at energy systems, we have three primary energy systems. We have our ATP, our adenosine triphosphate phosphocreatine system. We have our anaerobic glycolysis. So both of these systems here are anaerobic based and they do not require oxygen to, uh, to break down or use energy. And then we have oxidative phosphorylation, which actually is our aerobic metabolism and requires oxygen to release energy or kind of uh, use energy and break down energy. So each energy system here is influenced by a number of factors. Firstly, we can look at the FIT principle, frequency, intensity, time, type. So this principle will determine what energy system we'll be, we'll be using or training at. This is really going to depend on the individual or the athlete. We can look at nutritional status. What is, the, what is their diet that they're consuming? So are they consuming optimal nutrients? Are they not consuming optimal nutrients? So that could have an influence on each energy system as well. We can look at sex, male or female. Male and females are 
they have differences within their hormones which can ultimately influence these energy systems age ages is another thing that something that we don't really have control over but as we age you know we get decreases in various hormones like growth hormone and testosterone which can kind of influence the way these energy systems can potentially operate at let's also look at genetics so genetics is we can look at fast twitch fibers slow twitch fibers every individual is born differently and we don't really have control over that but that could influence what energy system an individual may be most optimal or uh, to use or most optimal at and then we have status of the tissue so is the tissue damaged is it healthy and that has an influence with regards to recovery and exercise and whatnot so I've highlighted the top two here so the fit principle and nutritional status the reason why I've highlighted these is in green is because we have direct control over these two factors. So we have control over how we train and what we eat. So if we're training, so specifically for an anaerobic athlete, if we're training anaerobically, then we can potentially optimize and improve our anaerobic system, which is what an anaerobic athlete would want. And the nutritional status, if we're consuming an optimal diet, a good diet, and we're supporting, we're eating the right foods to support anaerobic glycolysis, then we can potentially improve our performance. However, if we're not training properly or we're not eating the proper foods, then this, this could actually be detrimental to anaerobic glycolysis or the other energy systems. With regards to sex and age, now these aren't controllable factors. We don't have any control over them just because sex is how we're born. Age is just as we don't have control over how we age. We just, as we get older, we know that various hormones and things decrease. And then ultimately we have genetics and status of the tissue. So genetics and status of, this, of our tissue, I've highlighted in yellow because in a sense we can have an indirect influence on them from our training and also our diet. So we can, now although we're born with certain genetics, we can actually improve those genetics if we eat a proper diet and if we train properly. And that could also influence the status of the tissue as well. So if we're eating the proper foods, we're training properly, we're not overtraining, then we can keep our tissues healthy and we can keep them optimal for our next training bouts or whatnot. However, on the other side of things, if we're not eating a healthy diet, we're eating a lot of bad foods, just unhealthy foods, and we're not training often or we're not following a proper training program, then our genetics or status of the tissue can actually become worse, which is not what we want in terms of optimizing performance. Mm -hmm. So now as we move on, we're going to be talking now about anaerobic glycolysis. So what is anaerobic glycolysis basically? It's the primary energy system for anaerobic based sports. So it's the way that we're kind of we're creating energy without the presence of oxygen, which is what anaerobic means. So like some examples, 100 meter sprinting, 200 meter sprinting, 400 meter sprinting, basketball, hockey, they are primarily all anaerobic based sports. With regards to anaerobic glycolysis, it's supplying energy for high intensity exercise for about up to two minutes. It works at a very rapid and fast weight, so it's generating energy very quickly. And it produces about two to three ATP molecules through one cycle. Also, glycolysis, it involves the incomplete metabolism of a glucose molecule into pyruvate or lactate. So pyruvate and lactate are end products of glycolysis. And they still contain a lot of high energy bonds as they move through glycolysis. And those can kind of be used for different uh, parts. Or they could also be used as kind of fuel sources as well, which I'll kind of touch on later in this presentation. So as we see glucose, as we consume it, it can be, will be converted into pyruvate as we go through glycolysis. And then pyruvate can either go to lactate or it can go into the Krebs cycle which Krebs cycle is our aerobic metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation. So the system with regards to glycolysis, it never shuts off. It is always working no matter what. It's just, it's going to be dominant at certain periods, specifically at high intensity exercise within the first two minutes. So here I have a graph kind of explaining this now. What I have on the Y axis on the left here is high intensity work or performance with 12 being the highest, zero being the worst kind of performance.
then we have time on the x-axis and so as we see is that our performance is decreasing as the time increases so our first energy system ATP phosphocreatine is going to be dominant with about in about the first 10 seconds of high intensity exercise and this would be specifically uh, we're talking about our power athletes or Olympic kind of lifting athletes individuals that may do hand cleans power cleans deadlifts bench press for like one to three rep maxes these are those athletes that are going to be dominant here and so they're relying on that ATP phosphocreatine system which will last up to about 10 seconds after this anaerobic glycolysis will then take over which is we're still performing at a high we're still performing high intensity work at a high level our performance is still high but our anaerobic glycolysis now is taking over to kind of supply our energy demands because we cannot keep up with those same demands with, a, with regards to ATP phosphocreatine because that system becomes depleted after about 10 seconds of high intensity work. So anaerobic glycolysis takes over and this is where we see our sprinters, our short, uh, sp short kind of speed sprinters, 100, 200 meters, 400 meters, or hockey athlete, basketball athlete. And then we have our aerobic metabolism or oxidative phosphorylation, which is specifically our endurance athletes, like our marathon runners which will take over after about two minutes or so and we see this performance kind of uh, decrease over time so the important thing here though is that all three energy systems are always working they're always working no matter what it's just one is going to be uh, more dominant over the others at various times and that's going to depend on that fit principle frequency intensity time type so it's going to depend on the type of training, the intensity of the training, and the frequency of training, and uh, how long you're training for. So that's going to influence which energy system you're going to use. So for this kind of presentation, we'll be talking about the anaerobic-based athlete, and we'll be talking about anaerobic glycolysis. So to begin anaerobic glycolysis, getting into the specific metabolic pathway now, what we have here is that we have our blood on the left side. We have the, the membrane here which is where molecules have to cross in order to enter into, to enter into the inside of the muscle cell, which we have on the right here. So within the membrane, we have this GLUT1 and GLUT4, which you're probably wondering what this is. Those are just short uh, form names for glucose transporter 1 and glucose transporter 4. And so what we have is blood glucose or glucose within our blood. And, you know, we, we have blood glucose levels just kind of normal at rest, and they change with regards to exercise and whatnot. But typically you'll see an increase in blood glucose after we consume a, maybe a large carbohydrate meal. And so what ends up happening is that the glucose will cross the membrane through v, via facilitated diffusion, and this will occur via these glucose transporter proteins. So with glucose transporter 1, this kind of maintains our basal uh, levels of glucose uh, within the uh, within the muscle. So what ends up happening is if we have a decrease in glucose in the muscle, then we're going to see a greater expression of these glucose transporter 1 to kind of move more glucose, glucose into the muscle. And this is kind of independent of insulin now. So it's not regulated by insulin. So it just kind of operates on its own. With regards to glucose transporter 4 now, this is more responsive uh, to insulin and it's going to kind of depend on insulin so what you'll see is that when we consume a like large carbohydrate meal for example after eating that we get this spike in insulin so the pancreas will release the hormone insulin which insulin will then bind onto an insulin receptor on the membrane which then will cause this release of this protein cascade of events to influence these glucose transporter 4 molecules so you have a greater expression or greater release of these glucose transporter 4 molecules to move that blood glucose from the blood move those glucose molecules into the muscle so the reason this is occurring is because we need to insulin is helping to maintain proper blood glucose levels so making sure they're not too high or too low so typically when we lead a large carbohydrate meal our blood glucose levels are going to shoot up and increase so to kind of bring them back to normal and decrease them insulin will act on the insulin receptor influence glucose transporter 4 increases activity so more glucose will move into the cell and we can reduce that blood glucose level so that's why that's important with regards to insulin so now then we have glucose moving in to the muscle and we could also have exercise now influencing 
the release of glucose into the muscle. So with regards to the exercise, we have a large increase in blood glucose uptake in the muscle because with exercise, we're breaking out a lot of glucose molecules and we need the energy from glucose to kind of support various metabolic reactions in our body. So that's why we have this large increase in uptake of glucose into the body. However, the, the, the key thing here to mention is that, and this kind of sounds counterintuitive, is that actually insulin decreases during exercise. The reason insulin decreases during exercise is to help, help maintain those blood glucose levels. So it sounds counterintuitive because if we decrease insulin, we, in a sense, decrease, decrease glucose transport or flow activity. However, there's other physiological mechanisms that could potentially increase that glucose transport or flow expression, which allow for more glucose to move in. As well as we have the glucose transport of one, which could also see, see an increase in that to transport more glucose in. And another key thing is that with regards to the working muscle, we have an increase in skeletal muscle blood flow to that working muscle, which is going to transport more insulin glucose to that area, which could still allow for that glucose to move in. So we have more glucose in the area, more glucose can move into the muscle. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. And that's how we get that increase in glucose into the muscle, although we have that drop in insulin during exercise. So now once we have glucose into the muscle, it will then be converted into glucose 6-phosphate via the enzyme hexokinase. So kinase meaning it's transporting a phosphate group onto glucose. So we see magnesium ATP. So what this is, is a, so ATP, adenosine triphosphate, like I mentioned before, is bound with magnesium. So in order for ATP to bi be biologically active, it needs to be bound to magnesium. So magnesium works by stabilizing the negative charges on the oxygen groups of the phosphate molecule, which I'll talk about in the next slide a little bit. So right here we see our first cofactor being used in this reaction, which is magnesium. So magnesium is helping support the transfer of that phosphate group to glucose 6-phosphate. So we have adenosine triphosphate, and we're producing an adenosine diphosphate. So we're transporting one of the three phosphate groups to glucose 6-phosphate. And we need magnesium to help support this reaction. So just to kind of explain what cofactors and coenzymes are in terms of overview. So cofactors, coenzyme, they increase the function of enzymes. And they can, be con they can be considered helper molecules for various bi biochemical reactions. So the cofactors are inorganic, specifically our metals, so like iron, copper. Those are kind of, those are inorganic since they're from non-living matter. Where coenzymes are from living matter, so a good example would be vitamin B12 um, or other various vitamins. For that matter, they come from living matter, and they help support these reactions. They work in the same way, though, cofactors, coenzymes. So glucose 6-phosphate will then be converted into fructose 6-phosphate, where we're just kind of changing the arrangement of the molecule, and that's through an isomerase reaction, or enzyme. And then fructose 6-phosphate can move through glycolysis. So to explain how the magnesium is working on ATP, what we have here is our adenosine group, and then our triphosphates, where our three phosphate molecules. And so magnesium helps kind of stabilize the negative charges on the oxygen molecules. And so this is important because ATP contains a lot of energy. And when it contains a lot of energy, the molecule becomes very unstable. So magnesium being a positively charged ion stabilizes those oxygen, negatively charged oxygen molecules. And that prevents the molecule from potentially being broken down or attacked by other molecules or ions in the body, which would maybe remove that phosphate group or maybe prevent from uh, ATP from being uh, kind of created. So magnesium acts to kind of stabilize the molecule since it's very unstable and contains a lot of energy. And it's also helping support the transport of the, that phosphate group onto the glucose molecule. So here we see glucose 6-phosphate. So each carbon molecule is labeled from 1 to 6. The phosphate is attaching, the phosphate group is attaching onto the carbon 6 molecule, which is at the top here we see. That's why it's called glucose 6-phosphate, and magnesium is helping support that. So kind of back to the beginning here of glycolysis, before we kind of move on, we need to talk about the breakdown of glycogen or glycogenolysis here. So glycogen is the stored form of glucose in the muscle. So it's basically a glucose molecule just stored in the muscle. That's why we term it glycogen. We term it glycogen because it's a long kind of chain of glucose molecules that are all linked together, but they're just they're stored in the same way and just called glycogen. Uh, 
And so glycogen, when we engage in exercise or we need glucose, glycogen will be broken down into glucose 1-phosphate. And glucose 1-phosphate will be, so glycogen will be converted to glucose 1-phosphate via glycogen phosphorylase A. And an inorganic phosphate is coming on attaching onto the carbon 1 of that glucose molecule. And this is supported by vitamin B6. So vitamin B6 is actually supporting this reaction. And it's a coenzyme. And it's very essential to this reaction. Because B6, it, its active form is known as paradoxal 5-phosphate, which is the active form of vitamin B6. And this is involved in glycogen breakdown. So it kind of helps uh, with that phosphorylase enzyme. It ultimately kind of helps form that phosphorylase enzyme, which, which ultimately helps break, break down glycogen into glucose 1-phosphate. So if you think about it, if an athlete had a deficiency in vitamin B6, they may have a difficult time breaking down glycogen. And if they have a difficult time breaking down glycogen, they're not going to be utilizing glucose or breaking down glucose through glycolysis. And therefore, they're not generating ATP as efficiently as they should be. And this could be a problem because now a lot of other reactions in the body are not going to be working optimally. And, and then ultimately, fatigue could be occurring. Or fatigue could occur if you can't break down glycogen. At an optimal rate so the fatigue could occur much quicker uh, than when one would want and this could be detrimental to the anaerobic athlete's performance and then ultimately glucose 1 phosphate will be converted to glucose 6 phosphate via a mutase enzyme so you're kind of just changing where that phosphate group is so you're changing it from the carbon 1 to the carbon 6 and so magnesium may also play a role here in helping with that transfer of that phosphate group to the glucose 6 phosphate and it's also important to note that magnesium also may play a role with the inorganic phosphate uh, attaching onto the glucose, uh, forming that glucose 1-phosphate molecule as well. So if we look at glucose 1-phosphate, we just see the phosphate groups attached on the carbon 1 molecule. And magnesium may play a role in, in kind of helping stabilize those charges and help with the transfer of the phosphate group onto the glucose 1-phosphate. So now as we continue on through glycolysis... We see fructose 6-phosphate will be formed into fructose 1,6-diphosphate. So we have two phosphate groups on the fructose molecule, the carbon 1 and the carbon 6. And this is by phosphofructokinase. So we have another ATP coming on, donating its phosphate group, and we're producing an ADP. So we mentioned how magnesium is important in the transfer of the phosphate group. So magnesium acting as a cofactor again in this reaction. Now phosphofructokinase is the rate-limiting enzyme of glycolysis. And it's an irreversible reaction. So once we convert fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-diphosphate, we cannot go back. It's an irreversible reaction. We are now fully committed to glycolysis at this point. A lot of the reactions in glycolysis are reversible, but this is the one that's not, and this is what kind of controls glycolysis. It's going to determine if glycolysis is going to continue or kind of discontinue. So we have our allosteric modulators or regulators. So when we have an increase in adenosine monophosphate, AMP, or adenosine diphosphate, ADP, phosphofructokinase activity is going to increase because this means we're breaking down a lot of ATP or using a lot of ATP. So adenosine monophosphate just means there's, uh, you have the adenosine group with one phosphate, diphosphate, two phosphate groups. So as we see within these reactions in hexokinase, phosphofructokinase, we're using ADP and creating a lot of ADP. This means we're already breaking down a lot of ATP. So we want to, this could be occurring during exercise. And this is why we would increase fructokinase activity because we need the energy. We need energy. And so we need more ATP to kind of continue met metabolism and other reactions in the body to keep them going. Now, our allosteric inhibitors, what's going to inhibit this enzyme from occurring would be creatine phosphate, which stands for CP, citrate, which we see in uh, oxidative phosphorylation, and ATP, high levels of ATP. So high levels of these three molecules will actually inhibit this molecule from occurring. The reason being is if we have high amounts of citrate, creatine phosphate, ATP, this means we might not be doing a lot of work. This means we would be at rest because we're not actually using that energy. We're not breaking down a lot of things and we don't need it. So therefore, we would inhibit phosphofructokinase and inhibits activity and we kind of reduce glycolysis itself. So those are the important inhibitors of the reaction. So moving on, so we just look at the fructose 1,6-diphosphate molecule. So we look at the phosphate groups attached on the 1 and 6-carbon molecules. Now you can see the shape is different than glucose here. We've changed the shape. 
Cells we move on, fructose 1,6-diphosphate will now be converted into two separate molecules. We have the dihyd uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and this is occurring via an atolase. So it's breaking down that fructose 1,6-diphosphate into two separate molecules here. However, the dihydroxyacetone phosphate will be converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate via isomerase. And so now we get two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates being produced. So we have two separate kind of reactions occurring here now. And they're the same reaction actually occurring, but just occurring twice. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate will be con converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This will be occurring via glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. And this is where we get our first oxidation reduction reaction. So we have an inorganic phosphate coming on. So we're adding another inorganic phosphate. But we have NAD plus here, which is the oxidizing agent. And then it's becoming into a reduced form into, the, into NADH plus H. So magnesium and vitamin B3 here are acting as important cofactors and coenzymes. So vitamin B3, also known as niacin, is a precursor for NAD, which is nicotinamide identity dinucleotide, which is what NAD stands for. And so we need niacin in order to produce nicotinamide identity dinucleotide. Without NAD, we wouldn't be able to move through the glycolysis. Or we could have maybe delays in glycolysis, or we might not be, if we had deficiencies in it, we might not be able to opt optimally move through this reaction here. So what is happening ultimately is NAD plus, the oxidizing agent now, is forming into NADH plus H. So it's basically taking protons, hydrogen ions, from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate as well as electrons from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate via the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase and producing NADH plus H. So within more detail, if we look at it, what we have here is our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate on the left. It's removing its hydrogen ion on the first carbon molecule. So the NAD plus removing that hydrogen ion from the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, so that proton, and as well as electron comes with, with a proton also comes an electron, we form the NADH plus or NADH plus now. They're probably wondering where that other hydrogen and electron uh, are coming from. So what we have, we also mentioned inorganic phosphates coming on. So now this is inorganic phosphate within basically another oxygen, with another oxygen. So that other oxygen is also coming from water. So we have this oxygen and we have this hydrogen here now, which are coming from water. So water is also being used in this reaction. And so we also, now I also have this magnesium at the bottom, which helps kind of stabilize that transfer of the phosphate group onto the 1,3-biphosphoglycerate. So what we see here is that the hydrogen from H2O, we produce the hydrogen, that extra hydrogen now, and the oxygen molecule that we have from water will now go onto the one carbon here, and the phosphate group will then attach on top, on top of that to add that extra phosphate group. So we have a phosphate on the one carbon and the three carbon now on one three bits phosphoglycerate. So NAD plus is ultimately picking up two electrons and two protons, hydrogens. And that's why we have an oxidation reduction reaction occurring. So we're removing those electrons and hydrogens um, from that reactant that NAD plus is reacting with. And that's occurring via the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. So now as we move on through glycolysis, we have this 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, which will then be converted into 3-phosphoglycerate via 3-phosphoglycerate kinase. This is our first step where we're producing ATP. So now I have two pathways here because it's occurring twice, as I mentioned before. So that's important to remember. So here's our first step where we have ATP actually being produced. So we have two ATP here actually being produced now. And this, we know magnesium is playing an important role in kind of transferring that phosphate group. So we're moving the phosphate group from the one carbon on the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And we're left with a 3-phosphoglycerate. 3-phosphoglycerate will then move on, be converted into 2-phosphoglycerate uh, via the mutase enzyme, via a mutase enzyme. And then we can move through glycolysis to get through 2-phosphoglycerate, which will then 
will form phosphenolpyruvate via enolase, and this is where we have an H2O water coming off. And magnesium is playing an important role uh, in this reaction. And so then phosphenolpyruvate can then move through glycolysis. So to kind of look in more detail what magnesium is doing with the enolase uh, enzyme, is that magnesium is stabilizing the deprotonated oxygen ion. So firstly, before we get into that, the hydrogen molecule and the oxygen hydrogen at the bottom, as we see, the hydroxyl group there are being removed and forming H2O via the enolate. So that's where these molecules are coming off. And then you can see the kind of the difference uh, within the phosphenolpyruvate. So the magnesium here now, how it's playing a role is it's stabilizing the depronated oxygen ion on the carboxyl group there. And as we kind of move through it, as we kind of move through it then, it's stabilizing uh, the negative charges and then allowing for the H2O to kind of be removed. And that's where we get phosphenolpyruvate. And then phosphenolpyruvate will be then produced into pyruvate, which we now have pyruvate kinase. This is our second step where we're producing ATP now. So ADP getting converted into a so ADP into ADP, magnesium playing an important role here, acting as a cofactor, helping stabilize kind of that transfer of the negative charges of the phosphate group. So now we have another two ATP produced. So that's four ATP ultimately being produced here. Then as we continue through pyruvate now, we know that's an end product of glycolysis. Two things can happen to it, but first, lac pyru pyruvate can be converted into lactate via lactate dehy uh, dehy dehy dehydrogenase. And this is occurring, and we have an another kind of oxidation reduction reaction occurring here where NADH plus H is now going into, for, it's going from its reduced form into an oxidized form, NAD plus. So the opposite is happening from that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate uh, dehydrogenase. And so now we have the transfer of electrons and protons onto lactate. That's what's ultimately forming that lactic molecule. So keep in mind those electrons and protons have energy as well, so they're transporting more energy to the lactate molecule. So as lactate is produced here, keep in mind lactate and pyruvate still have about 80% of the energy from glucose, even though they're end products. So lactate can now move out it could kind of move out of the inside of the cell, move across the membrane and into the blood. But this will occur via our monocarboxylate transporters, which we have mono, which are what the MCT1 and 4 stand for. So we have monocarboxylate transporter 1 and monocarboxylate transporter 4. So what they will do is they will transport lactate out of the muscle cell and they will transport it to other areas of the body and take it up in other tissues. So it can be taken up in, for instance, areas like the heart, brain, or aerobic skeletal muscle and it can be used as a fuel because it still has about 80% of its energy from glucose. So that's the important thing to keep in mind here. So I'm going to talk about this in a little bit uh, further further on in the presentation. I'll talk about how it relates to kind of fatigue here. The other key thing is pyruvate can also go to the Krebs cycle and it can go through oxidative phosphorylation where we now we're using oxygen to kind of produce more energy as we get into aerobic metabolism. So I'll kind of save that for a future lecture, which I'll get into in a future lecture. Well, what we see with lactate dehydrogenation, just to kind of go back a few steps to see what's happening here, is the two protons are coming on, and we're losing two electrons as well. So two electrons are coming on to lactate, and we see just them kind of being added onto the lactate molecule from pyruvate. Just to show you how that works. Now, what is happening with the fate of lactate so firstly, lactate is important in keeping glycolysis going via NAD plus cycling. So with lactate, we're producing an NAD plus, so that oxidized form now, which ultimately can go back to that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase here. It can kind of go back to that reaction and be used to keep the cycling of glycolysis going because in this NADH plus H can then go to that lactate dehydrogenase, and we have this constant kind of cycle continuously going on. So that's why it's important that an individual consumes vitamin B3 or niacin because it acts as a precursor for NAD+. So with deficiencies in that, we might not be able to kind of continue through this process.
At the same time now, another important thing with lactate is lactate still has about 80% of the energy from glucose, which I mentioned before. And lactate, as we transport it out of the muscle, it can then be used by the heart, liver, brain, or aerobic skeletal muscle as energy or as a fuel. So we can look at gluconeogenesis, which is a whole another metabolic pathway, which I'll maybe get into in a future lecture, which kind of shows how lactate is being used as a fuel. And then lastly, lactate is always constantly being produced, even when there's adequate oxygen available, uh, because this is just due to the substrates being available. So lactate will be constantly be, be produced because of there's always the because of the, the substrates being available. So now, with regards to these monocarboxylate transporters and lactate, with regards to metabolism and glycolysis now. As we constantly keep going through glycolysis, we generate a lot of lactate and hydrogen. So as lactate and hydrogen increase, well, physically we'll talk about lactate first, is that if we get a lot of accumulation of lactate, a huge buildup of lactate within the muscle, it's going to inhibit lactate dehydrogenase from occurring. It's going to prevent this whole reaction from occurring. We're getting this end product inhibition. So high amounts of lactate will inhibit lactate dehydrogenase. And so if we inhibit lactate dehydrogenase, a lot of problems are going to start to occur and fatigue. This is how one-way fatigue can occur. At the same time is that we get these increase in hydrogen ions because we're also producing hydrogen ions here. They will cause a decrease in pH. Well, this could be good initially. A slight decrease in pH can be good initially it could be because it could increase maybe the activity of some enzymes, but it also can decrease some other enzymes as well. However, if we get a significant increase in hydrogen ions, that pH can drop significantly, we're going to become more acidic, and a lot of these enzymes are going to become denatured, they're going to break down, they're not going to be working, and then this whole system is going to be kind of screwed up in a sense, and fatigue can occur. So, this increase, back to this increase in lactate now, this is where the monocarboxylate transporters are going to come into play. If we have more monocarboxylate transporters, we could transport more lactate out of the muscle and prevent this buildup of lactate. However, just to kind of show you what's going to go on with, with large amounts of lactate, another we kind of mentioned it inhibits lactate dehydrase, creates this end product inhibition, lactate is going to cause this whole backup of glycolysis. So we're going to get an increase in pyruvate then, and then which is going to, we're going to get an increase in phosphatidylpyruvate, we're going to inhibit pyruvate kinase, inhibit enolase, which is going to ultimately, we're going to prevent ATP from being created. And then we can go back to the three phosphoglycerate kinase, mutase. Those are going to be inhibited because we're going to have build up of phosphoglycerate uh, molecules. And then ATP is not going to be produced. We're not going to be, be, we're not, so now ultimately we're not producing ATP as we continuously get this back up. And eventually we'll go all the way back to fructose 1,6-diphosphate because now, we cannot go backward because this is an irreversible reaction. Fructo, phosphofructokinase will not, it will not continue to go backwards because at this step, this is where we're fully committed to glycolysis. But we can, as we get this buildup of fructose 1,6-diphosphate, now we know we're not generating ATP from those other reactions. If we're not generating ATP, other reactions, proton pumps, sodium potassium ATP pump, they are not going to be working, and therefore muscle fatigue is going to occur. We're going to have a lot of problems occurring within the muscle, specifically within the muscle. And so, kind of mentioned fossil fructokinase being that rate limiting enzyme or irreversible reaction. So now, can we prevent lactate end product inhibition? Not really, but we can potentially delay the fatigue process by increasing the amount of monocarboxylate transporters that are that are in our muscle. So. MCT1, MCT4, the more we can increase these transporters, the more lactate we could pump out of the muscle, and then we could transport it and allow it to be taken up by other areas in the body to be kind of be used as a fuel, because remember, it still contains a lot of energy, about 80% of the energy from glucose. So by increasing the number of MCTs, we'll allow for greater transportation of lactate out of the muscle into other areas, like I mentioned. And now the key thing is, how do we increase these MCTs in our body? Simple, be through, tr through training. So there's been uh, so we can see with research the research has been shown that with with regards to trading we can actually increase these transporters so it's more of an adaptation that can occur over time so this is where a good workout program as well as a good diet can influence the amount of these transporters in our body so if we're engaging in an optimal training program we can increase these transporters get that adaptation 
then more efficiently pump lactate out of our muscle and therefore del potentially delay the onset of fatigue, which would be very important for any athlete, but specifically for this, the anaerobic athlete. So to kind of wrap up the product, the production of ATP from glycolysis, we see that hexokinase uses one ATP, fossil fructokinase uses one ATP, the glycerol 3 -phos phosphate dehydrogenase is producing two NADHs plus H. So remember at that step, we have two of those glycerol 3 phosphate molecules. Now those two NADHs uh, plus H, now those can be used to kind of keep glycolysis going, or they could actually go to the electron transport chain and be used uh, to produce energy that would be via aerobic metabolism though, for the use of oxygen, which could potentially happen as well. But we'll kind of touch on that maybe in a future presentation or lecture. And then we look at 3 phosphoglycerate kinase is producing 2 ATP, and then pyruvic kinase is producing 2 ATP, because those are steps that are occurring twice. So ultimately, we get this net worth of 2 ATP produced. So we're using 2, but producing 4, so we get this net worth of 2 ATP. However, if we would go back to the glycogen, glycogen breakdown, we're skipping the hexokinase phase. For, so we're skipping that one usage of ATP, which could ultimately mean that we're only using one ATP and we're producing four, so we get a net kind of gain of three ATP. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot, but this process occurs very quickly. And you could think about it, it works very rapidly to kind of produce ATP, although it might not seem like a lot. So that's the ultimate how much ATP we are producing with and without glyc glycogen. So now anaerobic glycolysis and the aerobic, and the aerobic, anaerobic athlete. So the anaerobic athlete needs food. So they need carbohydrates, specifically like a quick dissolving kind of carbohydrate, a quick digesting carbohydrate, like glucose post-exercise for those depleted glycogen levels in the body and in the muscle. So they need to replenish those levels post-exercise. So depleted light glycogen levels are another way basically fatigue occurs. So we could have central nervous system fatigue actually occurring due to depleted brain glycogen or muscle fatigue due to depleted muscle glycogen. So that's why we need to consume carbohydrates, quick digesting carbohydrates post-exercise for the anaerobic athlete after performing their high intensity activity. So the amount of carbohydrates will vary between individual. This will depend on a lot of things. Uh, so they're the size of the individual, their training status, how long they're training for. So really that fit principles coming into play here. So moving on, also, magnesium is an important cofactor in many different steps in glycolysis. So deficiencies in magnesium, an individual may not be able to rapidly move through glycolysis, which could be detrimental to performance. Vitamin B3 niacin is um, an important uh, vitamin because it's a precursor for NAD+, which is important as we see in glycolysis. So with deficiencies in that, one may not be able to move through glycolysis as well. We also saw how vitamin B6 is a very important glycogen breakdown. Deficiency of vitamin B6, the anaerobic athlete might not be able to break down that glycogen as efficiently as they would want to. And therefore, they're not going to be breaking or using glucose as energy as efficiently. And therefore, performance may decrease. They might not have as much energy and fatigue could be onset at a quicker rate. So deficiencies ultimately in any of these can be detrimental to performance since anaerobic glycolysis may not work optimally. So we kind of need these to kind of su support that anaerobic athlete. So where do we get kind of magnesium and vitamin B3 from, but also uh, B6? So we get them from food. So magnesium is a central molecule of chlorophyll, which is found in leafy green plants. So the question is, how many people actually eat leafy green plants or vegetables? I tell you, not very many individuals do. And if they aren't, then they're not really consuming, they might not be consuming optimal amount of magnesium, although magnesium can be still found in a lot of other foods, such as pumpkin seeds, almonds, peas, which is kind of stated by Dietitians Canada. But with regards to green vegetables, <coughs> there are a lot of other benefits to eating those as well. So also niacin and uh, pyridoxine, pyridoxine uh, typically highest in various fish and meat, so niacin, pyridoxine, vitamin B3 and B6. Typically find these in various fish and meat, which is, typically, uh, which is based on Dietitians Canada. And you can also get these kind of nutrients from supplements as well if one is very highly deficient in them. So how do we optimize the anaerobic athlete and anaerobic glycolysis? 
So we want to consume an optimal diet for your training and performance needs. So carbohydrates, magnesium, vitamins, vitamins B3, B6. Um, you want to train anaerobically frequently to increase your metabolic enzymes. So we talked about increasing the monocarboxylate transporters, but also the glucose transporters as well. So we can, if we can increase, so it's with training, we can also increase those glucose transporters. If we can increase those glucose transporters, we can get more glucose into the muscle much more quickly, and therefore we can break down glucose much more efficiently and quicker, and we can kind of support the athlete's need during exercise. So with training, these are some adapt adaptations that can occur over long periods of training. And then lastly, you want to engage in the proper recovery strategies, allow for your tissues to heal, so when, and also uh, for allowing for, to refuel, because if they're damaged and you're working out or you're not recovering properly and you go to work out, you can maybe cause harm to those tissues, which is not good, and your performance will ultimately kind of be decreased and potentially your injury uh, rate may increase as well. So that's it, guys, um, for this little presentation on the anaerobic athlete and anaerobic glycolysis. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I know it's kind of a little bit of a different lecture or presentation that I did, and it's something I wanted to kind of uh, just kind of share with you guys. It's really it's a little bit more advanced in terms of the exercise physiology and sports nutrition side. So sports nutrition, when you kind of refer to that, it's more of just like a exercise physiology because as a nutritionist or sports nutritionist, it's important to understand a lot of these metabolic pathways and how a lot of these enzymes cofactors, coenzymes, like vitamins and minerals and how they work and how they can support these athletes because I know a lot of people from a general sense that may give nutrition information don't really understand this and don't really understand how a lot of these things work. So kind of getting into details and the pathways, some of the molecular biology as well would be is important to understand if someone is kind of going to give that sort of advice. But at the same time, for a lot of athletes that don't understand how a lot of these nutrients work, cofactors, coenzymes, he, this is kind of a presentation or a little lecture to kind of show you how they actually work in terms of supporting the anaerobic athletes, specifically anaerobic glycolysis. So within future athletes, I'll talk about how the ATP fossil creatine system will be supportive of a power athlete, like a power lifter or some sort of uh, strength athlete, like an Olympic lifter. And then I'll talk about aerobic metabolism, oxidative phosphorylation, how that is. I'll talk about like their nutritional needs and how they can support that aerobic metabolism uh, for an endurance athlete or whatnot. Now keep in mind, guys, this is just some of the nutritional needs for an anaerobic athlete. I didn't talk about everything. So you, as you see, I didn't talk about how protein would be important in kind of repairing the muscles. I didn't talk about uh, various anti-inflammations like omega-3s, omega-6, how those are important. I just talked about what an anaerobic, needs, or an anaerobic athlete needs specifically to su support anaerobic glycolysis. Uh, during their performance because that's their primary energy system that, are, that they are using during those anaerobic activities So guys, that's it for this little special presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys learned something and If you enjoyed this video uh, and you want me to make more videos uh, Similar to to this be sure to give this a thumb thumbs up and if you have any questions comments or you're curious about something Please be sure to just leave a comment below guys, and I'll be happy to answer them Okay, guys, so that's it for uh, today. I wish you guys all the best and a successful and productive day. Take care, and until next time.